having fine finally managed to get ourselves face to face last month here we are again due to rail strikes snow and other things back on zoom um, but thank you very much for joining us um, Jason explained to me that he um, has his background he really started more as a radio reporter journalist and presented wildlife programs outdoor features and a variety of news stories for both um, BBC Scotland and Mary Park Radio, and then moved into PR in 2004, working with corporate communications, so Scottish Water, and then into the more political field um, for the Scottish Greens during um, the India and Brexit. That must be quite exciting. Um, and advertising campaign ad and advising academics. Um, and the RSPB in 2022, so we've not never been with them for all that long, but we've obviously quite a political background. Um, can I just ask everybody to maybe mute themselves a bit? It's just a lot of muffling going on in the background. Thanks. Um, and on the other side of things, he's also directed a book festival, organises a community cinema, and chairs a community group which looks after the Musselboro Lagoon's wildlife habitat. So very rounded and an, and an outdoor play charity, <laughs> which sounds really interesting. Um, so I think from our point of view, what we're most interested in is hearing about your thoughts on what this potentially has to no longer having um, the European legislation protecting lots of things that we hold dear, um, how that will affect the environment and other things and and also potential impact on the Scottish government to be able to do what it wants to do on devolved issues and it sounds as though you're in in, in a good place to be able to tell us about that sort of thing. Uh, um, uh, a fairly well recognized and effective political campaigner so we're really looking forward to hearing from you thank you very much Okay, um, so thank thank you for inviting me along. Uh, and yes, this is this is much easier than cycling through snowdrifts in uh, Fife. Um, uh, so thanks um, for for giving me the chance to talk about what we've been doing. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm the policy campaigns manager at RSPB Scotland, and obviously our interest is is anything that will improve the situation for nature because you know the big picture is that nature is in crisis. We've got lots of species that have been in decline in recent decades. Uh, we've had habitats being lost left, right and centre. So anything that helps us get that back is of interest to us. So actually the last thing we needed uh, was what uh, appeared on the horizon um, in September, mid-September. Um, so I can just kind of run through what we encountered at that point and what we've done since then. So basically what our, our beef is with what the UK government have been up to and what they're still up to, um, what our response has been and uh, what other people have been saying about what we've been saying, uh, what the impacts will be for wildlife and the environment in Scotland and more broadly potential impacts on other Scottish issues. Um, and then, yes, happy happy to take any questions. Um, so the, the thing at the centre of this was um, back in the middle of September, there was a bunch of actions that came forward from the UK government. So at this point, it was Liz Truss, I remember that Prime Minister, um, and they were proposing a bunch of things which really prompted the RSPB uh, to come out and say, we are angry. And it's not often that the RSPB says that. We're normally quite mild-mannered and civilised, and we have a very, very large membership, about a million members in the UK. And we tend to be quite, you know, small C conservative, I'd, I'd say usually. Um, but this really felt like a proper uh, all out attack on what we care about. So it prompted us to say that and mobilise support from our members and our followers and lots of other environmental groups followed uh, our lead. So the main concerns really at that point were that the UK government, and in particular, it was a minister at the time, Jacob Rees-Mogg, remember him? So they introduced a bill at Westminster called the Retained EU Law Bill. Uh, the idea behind that, uh, I'll go into in a wee minute. But at the same time, they're also talking 
in their growth plan. I can't remember who the chancellor was at the time, maybe it was Quasi Quarteng, but they were talking about investment zones. Uh, and these would be kind of deregulatory. So this would be get the red tape out of the way so that we can have lots more development and uh, economic activity. And that obviously rang a lot of um, alarm bells for us. Um, but yeah, the retained EU law bill, what that was and still is, because it's still a real threat, um, is the idea that all of the legislation that we've carried over from Europe as part of the transition, that will just fall off. Um, the statute books that will be sunsetted at the end of next year. And uh, a bit of digging, it turns out there are thousands of pieces of legislation that potentially will disappear at the end of next year. Uh, and these include uh, lots of protections that we've enjoyed uh, as uh, members of the EU for decades now, including environmental protections around things like uh, habitats, protecting special habitats. Um, so we launched into a campaign to make the public more aware of this, to express our feelings, to get their support. Um, we have had meetings, we did have meetings with UK government ministers at the time, but those meetings were pretty fruitless. We were basically saying to them, you need to give us the assurances, reassurances, that you're not going to uh, lower standards and uh, impact on the environment. And they just couldn't give us those assurances. It was pretty clear they'd come up with this kind of bonfire of EU legislation uh, to essentially please the kind of Brexit element of the party, uh, the Conservative Party. And they hadn't really put much thought into all the effort that would involve in the implications that it might have. So, that, so our attempt with, to engage with the UK government was not, not very fruitful at all. Engagement with the Scottish government was much better. Um, they wrote uh, in the early days to the UK government expressing their concern about this bill um, and not just about the environmental protections that were being put at risk, but also the fact that it seemed to overreach in terms of devolution. It basically gave the UK government uh, the right to go in and do things, which when it comes to something like the environment, you would think that the Scottish government uh, would have uh, responsibility there. Uh, and also the issue came up at First Minister's questions fairly early on, uh, specifically on the, the idea of investment zones, these deregulatory investment zones. Um, and again, because we engaged with Scottish government and they were quite constructive about that, the First Minister gave a very reassuring reply which was even if these things were to go ahead, then the Scottish government would apply, you know, very high environmental standards, environmental protections in those areas. So that gave us some reassurance that the Scottish government were, were on the right page. Um, so the retained EU law bill, it could do away with um, the things that we hold dear, like the habitats regulations, and these do apply in Scotland um, and can be affected by the UK government. So they're not completely devolved. Um, and the habitats regulations, for example, they, what they've done in the last 30 odd years is really steer development away from our best sites for wildlife. So actually, even developers like that kind of stability and just knowing where they are. So it gives them assurance that, you know, there are bits of the map that they probably shouldn't even bother with because they are protected sites. Uh, covered by the habitats regulations. The other aspect is uh, energy is, is a bit of a mixed bag in terms of who's responsible, UK or Scotland. Uh, and again, when it comes to consenting energy projects, that lies at the UK level. So again, you could see the UK deciding to enable some sort of, whether it's offshore or onshore energy development, uh, which could impact on a sensitive site for wildlife. Um, so then what happened was the SNP at Westminster picked it up and they led a debate in Westminster Hall on the issue and they highlighted specifically some of the RSPB's concerns about the environment. Uh, Labour's Ian Murray, he chipped into that debate as well and he specifically noted uh, that uh, MPs' inboxes had been flooded with furious uh, emails from RSPB members and members of other organisations um, and the UK minister, who I think has changed jobs subsequently, I can't remember his name, but in that debate, he just wasn't able to give the assurances that the SNP and Labour were looking for about the impact on the environment and things like food standards and so on. So this bill, let's not forget, it's not just about the environment, it affects 
thousands of bits of legislation covering workers' rights, things that affect farming, uh, you name it. Um, so the latest state of play on this bill is that the Scottish Government has recommended to the Scottish Parliament that it doesn't give consent to this bill. Um, the Scottish Parliament's uh, Constitution Committee did a wee inquiry, took evidence from a range of organisations about this bill and its impacts potentially on Scotland. RSPB gave evidence a couple of weeks ago to the committee. Um, there was widespread agreement from all the, the kind of witnesses that this bill is basically unworkable. Um, and I mean, the kind of key point about this retained EU law bill is that, you know, we're not opposed, RSPB, we're not opposed to changing these laws, but this isn't the way to do it. You know, potentially thousands of pieces of legislation that will just disappear at the end of next year. There's not been a proper analysis done of how many and what's been affected. And if you think about the resources in terms of staff and time to check this stuff out, to create any new provisions you want to create, it would just overwhelm the civil service. And crucially, I think, from a Scottish perspective, it potentially derails the legislation that is already being planned in the Scottish Parliament. And that's a big concern for us because RSPB Scotland, we're already working very hard with uh, MSPs and Scottish ministers and Scottish government on all sorts of bits of legislation. It's an incredibly busy session, this session of the Scottish Parliament. Um, and if you're interested in anything to do with wildlife or the environment, it is a really important session. We've got a bill uh, progressing through the Parliament to license grouse moors, to restrict uh, muir burning on peatland. We've got an agriculture bill coming that is going to decide on the future subsidy schemes for Scottish farming. That's really important if we want to incentivise uh, the kind of farming that is good for nature and good for the climate. Uh, we've got a natural environment bill coming down the track that will set targets for restoring habitats and protecting species. Uh, there's a new marine plan Scottish Government are proposing. So there's loads going on already and you can't help but think, well, what, is, what would this retained EU law bill do? You'd end up with the Parliament having to, I don't know, park all of this stuff and have to devote time uh, and energy to patching over the gaps that this uh, UK bill will create. And another a key aspect I would highlight about this bill, actually, is that there's a clause within it that says you cannot, if you decide, if you replace anything that it talks about, you cannot increase the regulatory burden um, which basically means that you can you can change the law, you can replace the laws that it's getting rid of, but you can't do it in a way that improves standards, that moves anything up the way. You can only keep it at the same level or go down, um, which I think is a pretty important uh, aspect to consider. Um, and I think from a Scottish perspective, and certainly from a Scottish government perspective, I think that poses a real challenge if you're trying to keep pace with EU standards, um, as I think the Scottish government has said it wants to do then th this bill potentially poses a problem where you, you're you basically not allowed to improve things at all. Um, so the current status on investment zones, that other idea that was floated, uh, Rishi Sunak came in, new Chancellor Jeremy Hunt, uh, Michael Gove also back in the cabinet. So investment zones seem to have been kind of squashed and turned into something else called growth clusters, a slightly different focus and they've said very reassuring things about the environment being protected so actually that kind of threat has receded we're really not so worried about that now but it is this retained eu law bill it's still at westminster it's been debated um it's yet to go to its third reading in the commons uh, it will then go to the lords and i think speaking to people that know the kind of westminster scene better than i do uh, their feeling is that it'll it'll get stuck It'll come up on sticky ground in the Lords because the Lords is packed with all sorts of experts on the issues um, that this bill raises. Um, and so, you know, kind of cross party in the Lords, there's real concern about this bill. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of long grass it runs into there. I think, though, the risk is that the longer that this bill hangs about at Westminster, the less likely, actually, that it gets um, squashed, that it gets canned because it is a key part of the kind of Brexit agenda of, of the UK government, getting rid of EU laws. But as I say, at the moment, it's sun, the aim is to sunset uh, these thousands of laws at the end of next year. Um, maybe they will just extend that date to give them a bit more breathing space, a bit more time to work this stuff out. So that's one option for them. 
the flip side though of course is that if they were to somehow just push this through and make it happen then it would have effect as soon as they pass it so it's not the case that they could pass this bill tomorrow and there would be no trouble until the end of next year it would take effect um straight away um so a final a final couple of points for you to bear in mind um there's other bits of legislation knocking around that are in the same kind of area so there is a leveling up and regeneration bill um, which before I arrived at RSPB, I assumed naively that this just affected England, but actually in a, in a similar way, it has a kind of overstepping into devolved areas uh, aspect to it. So it proposes, uh, for example, replacing uh, environmental impact assessments with a new kind of uh, streamlined environmental report uh, procedure, um, which to people in the RSPB sounds a bit kind of light touch and maybe not too friendly towards the environment and uh, habitats and wildlife. And again, that feels like overstepping in a an area that should be pretty devolved. Um, and I think within that levelling up bill, it talks about the UK government uh, consulting with Scottish government, um, but it doesn't talk about seeking consent, it just says it will consult with them, which I think is quite an important distinction. Um, so as we stand, the ball remains, I would say, in the UK government's court to provide the kind of detailed reassurances that the environmental movement is looking for, that we want the environment protected. They've yet to give us that kind of assurance. Um, we're still engaging as best we can. There's an umbrella group called Greener UK um, that's helping us do a lot of work at Westminster. Um, I would say that our ongoing dialogue with Scottish government officials is really, really good. Um, they're very open to conversations uh, and they continue to see the threat and the risk that this poses. Um, and I guess RSPB, as I said at the start, you know, we don't often say that we are angry and we don't often um, kind of rally people into a kind of um, baying mob. Uh, it's generally not our style. So we, we tend to pick these moments quite carefully. Um, so it's not to say we won't do that again. We will do if it's necessary. Um, but at the moment, it's a bit of a bit of a kind of watching brief and just trying to have conversations with people. Um, so that angry moment can't be ruled out. I don't think another one is imminent. Um, and yeah, like I say, the the our plate was already pretty full. There's a lot going on in the Scottish Parliament in terms of legislation we want to see. So it'd be a real shame to see any of that slowed down or derailed. And more broadly, there's a lot to do uh, in terms of biodiversity and agriculture, getting those things sorted uh, to turn uh, the population declines of wildlife around. And there's also a, a, a big new David Attenborough series on uh, the UK's wildlife and uh, the problems that it's been encountering. And that's coming up in the spring. So we're doing a lot of work with David Attenborough's team, uh, helping him film pieces of that. And we're obviously getting ready to make the most of that when it's on the telly and everybody's talking about it in the spring. So we've got all of this work already in train. So really, the last thing we needed was the UK government barging in with these slightly wacky ideas. Um, but as I say, it is still a real threat, the retained EU law bill. Um, so keep your eyes open for, for how that progresses. And um happy to take any questions. Hope that was hope that was useful. That was very useful. Thank you very much, um, Jason. Uh, I think that was a good overview of this horrific situation we've got into. Um, just so you know, I, I spent a long time in Brussels working in the Council Secretariat in the environment section. So I sat round tables making European law. And so just before we open to general discussion, I've got two kind of technical questions. Well, the first one isn't so technical. It's just a, a sort of factual thing. You did mention that you gave evidence um, as a group. And I mean, given that this, this covers so many areas of really key law that you can't just get rid of without replacing it, like water standards, air standards, um, food safety, so many of those things. And I just would be interested to hear um, how many other bodies were involved in giving evidence and, and what, sort, uh, what sort of um, sort of level of expertise and detail that the, the potentially really dangerous implications of getting rid of all this law were discussed. And also, my understanding with directly effective EU legislation that was um, part of a devolved subject area was that it was immediately legislated for in the Scottish Parliament. 
So that legislation must still be extant and can't be repealed by Westminster. And I just wonder what's going to happen there. Um, so if you can maybe look at those two things, that would be great. <laughs> Yeah. On, so on the last point, yeah, the, so there will be Scottish legislation. And um, as I said, there's, there's not really been a proper analysis of um, the, the impact and where this kind of steps over in Scotland. And when it comes to things like the habitats regulations that we care about, mm -hmm. then it does seem to be quite a mixed picture that there are some regulations where it looks as though the Scottish government is in charge, but others where it's very clear that it's still the UK government that could step in and change things. So there still needs to be a kind of proper analysis. And I think this is the thing that seems to flabbergast people. When we gave evidence to the, the Scottish Parliament's Constitution Committee, um, there, did, there did seem to be a just, you know, round the table, the politicians of different parties seemed really puzzled by this can't, is this really happening? Um, this doesn't seem to have been thought through um, at all. Um, and uh, in terms of the the kind of the range of evidence um, that's that's been taken by that committee, so uh, yeah, so RSPB spoke. Um, I'm trying to think who else spoke. Uh, Scottish Environment Link, I think, were there. So they're an umbrella group for about forty different organisations. Um, from memory, there were a couple of academics. Um, there may have been some trade unions as well, but this is they've they've taken a broad range of of witness kind of statements on this, and it's been something that we've been quite keen to stress with with the Westminster politicians we're dealing with. It isn't just about the environment. This is about food standards. It's about farming. It's about workers' rights. So it really is the you know the kind of full suite of <laughs> of how we approach how we just organise ourselves in in society almost. And what about business? I mean, it also has huge implications for business. Were there not businesses and like the CBI and people like that and the NFU and or were you in an environment only section? Yeah, I think we were on a, a panel that was mostly about environment. That is a good uh, question about about people like CBI and stuff like that. And I noticed that. So one of the other aspects of the attack on nature, as we were calling it in September, um, so along with the retained EU law bill, and this idea of investment zones that went away. Um, the other thing that made us a bit angry was down south, and that was the new kind of subsidy scheme for mm. farming. Yeah. We've yet to work mm. out doing in Scotland, but down south, they're a bit further along the track, and the idea was they were going to do more to incentivise nature and climate-friendly farming. That sounded great under a scheme called ELMS, mm. Environmental Land Management Scheme, something like that. Yeah. But the suggestion was were not interested in that kind of green stuff anymore and they were going to pull it. So that was part of the anger. But I now notice there's still a bit of campaigning going on around that by RSPB down south and WWF as well. And I noticed today that they've now got some big business names, including all the big supermarkets, Tesco and Asda and so on. So these business, these big businesses recognise that consumers now expect kind of high standards that they want, you know, good animal welfare, they want good environmental protections, you know, as standard now. So any suggestion of rolling back on this is that it's bad for business. So these business guys are are getting it as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Belle, did you have a question? Oh, where would I begin, Joe? There's, there's so many things that Jason's, um, you know, highlighted. Uh, Jason, I work with Scottish Environment Link quite a lot. Um, yeah, um, where do you begin? I think, just a little thing, I think the UK Environment Minister at that time might have been still George Eustace, might, may have been, and now it's Theresa Coffey, who's even more of a disaster. At least George Eustace was a farmer, and he is objecting to the Australian uh, trade deal, such as it is. Um, yeah, there's, there's an awful lot of things. I thought that um, EU law um, was, the, the term is transposition, isn't it? And I thought the, because the Scottish habitats regs are slightly different from the ones in England, in some respects, um, Scotland had transposed the European legislation into our own legislation. 
And I was hoping that a strong case could be made for retaining that. I mean, you've got such key European things that could, we, that could be lost. I mean, even basic things like the precautionary principle, which mm. is absolute key to such a lot of things, we could even lose that. Um, and yeah, Elms, I mean, there was even discussion in the media um, yesterday about Elms. Um, and uh, well, fingers crossed that that's retained. I, I mean, I, I honestly don't know how good it is, but it does seem to have some good things in it. There's also the Future Generations Bill, um, which they have actually, I think they've got in Wales, they were ahead of the curve. I think they've got a Future Generations Act already. And this is associated with um, how you, you know, we're doing such a lot of damage to the earth, both in biodiversity and climate change. And there is a need to be responsible um, for what we will hand on to future generations. And I think Scotland started discussing future generations. I don't think they've got as far as a bill yet. I know um, there's a group in link that have been, I think it's the economics, no, maybe the governance group that are looking at that. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, worried, I'm still worried about these investment zones, even if they're called growth clusters. And I think Scotland will actually buy into those because, you know, the Scottish government are known for having a lot of rhetoric, you know, which, you know, they, they speak to the public mood at the time. So they have the rhetoric, but they don't necessarily deliver on it. Um, yeah, you mentioned energy issues. Actually, um, con you know, consenting of energy projects, that's done by the Scottish Government. Yeah, energy's devolved to a certain extent. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Energy's devolved to a certain extent. Yeah. I mean, if you want to build a wind farm or a solar farm or something in Scotland, and, you know, there's a lot of objections and it has to be called in, it's Scottish Government reporters that make the recommendations and Scottish Government decides. That's not done by Westminster. I mean, the off, big offshore wind farms and trans, it's, the, it's only the transmission lines like the national grid. And you'll have heard, uh, was it this morning, about the, um, the transmission line has been consented from the Western Isles to the mainland. So that's going to, you know, enable the development of more renewable energy schemes in the island. Mm. Um, the other big issue that we've lost is, of course, the REACH chemicals register, and that's related to all sorts of industries, sorts of CBI things, even preparing food, using uh, ke chemotherapy drugs and things like that. You know, that, that's such a huge thing. And to my mind, Jason touched on this, I was pleased to hear him indicate this, the trouble is, I think the politicians don't have a clue. They don't know all the stuff. They haven't got it at their fingertips. Yeah, that's and, why I think this question is so important. Yeah. The, what you said at the beginning in terms of um, whether something's been transposed or not. Basically, mm -hmm. anything that's been passed in Brussels as a regulation is mm -hmm. directly effective. So the member state has to implement it word for word straight away. Mm -hmm. and. And with anything that's devolved, I think that had to be done in the Scottish Parliament. So I don't see how Westminster can, can revoke it. Yeah, directives, directives need to be transposed. And yes, they can sometimes not be transposed as effectively as they should be. Um, was, that, was that discussed? But when the Scottish government made its representations to um, Westminster, um, Jason, that, that Westminster can't revoke legislation that's been passed in the Scottish Parliament. Um, I don't. I can't remember if it was in their uh, letter to UK government, but I did go to a, um, a kind of webinar with a, a legal expert from. I can't remember who he was from. Maybe Dublin. Um, oh yes, Ryan Locke. Is that, is that who yeah, I'm thinking of? And yeah, they've they've got he, some really good people. Yeah. He mentioned he mentioned the idea of, you know, if Scottish ministers say. 
well, we've got a, a continuity act. We passed a continuity bill in Scotland mm. to try mm. and keep pace with the EU. But he did uh, flag um, the Internal Market Act, basically yeah. saying at that point, does the UK then invoke that and say, hang on a minute, if you're going to try doing something in Scotland that somehow, you know, doesn't um, allow a level playing field somehow makes things better or easier in Scotland, changes things in Scotland, does that then invite the UK government into some sort of legal challenge? Um, and the suggestion was that there are all sorts of kind of legal teams in different uh, departments just now kind of scrabbling around and basically gaming what might happen. So the Internal Market Act, I didn't mention that, but that's that's another factor to consider that if Scotland does decide to try and do something to keep up does the UK government then wade in with this act and say hang on a minute yeah yeah that's, that's worrying too yeah. Clive did you say you were wanting to to put your hand up oh you're hang on you're you're on you need to unmute yourself yeah the the problem with my reactions button is it's all about emoji. Um, I'm very happy to emote, but that doesn't ask a question. So, um, so I can't I can't say why I've only got emoji on it, but that's all I've got. Ah, okay. Uh, um, anyway, the, the first question is the the one I have put into chat. Um, if the UK Parliament in its legislation has failed explicitly to devolve powers, which it would still, I think, be entitled to do, to repeal that devolution of power, if it's not done that, and they're so incompetent they probably won't even think of the need to do that, then any act purporting to repeal those powers that didn't expressly say so would be liable to be found incompetent by the Supreme Court. Exactly. But if you think about how legislation needs to be labelled in the Westminster Parliament, which involves a title which sets the parameters that the legislation will cover, and that title has to be accurate. So if it doesn't say this is a bill uh, about reducing the power of the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Parliament, etc., etc., but only that it's about undoing Brussels legislation, then it would not be competent to include clauses reducing the powers of the Scottish Parliament in such a bill. Um, now I think um, the um, beautiful governments of 2022 don't have the technical competence to know this, and if the civil servants tell them, which they probably do, they are not listening. Uh, yeah. So I think they're probably legislating something that is an illegal uh, monster anyway. Hence what I had started to type, it might be a better use of Scottish Parliament time and everybody's time uh, to focus on the improvements, taking the uh, issues from Europe that are consistent with devolved powers because they affect those areas as a given which cannot be legislated away by this particular anti-EU piece of legislation and therefore can and should be built on by the Scottish Parliament as an example of what uh, everybody needs to see happening. And given the range of interests that have already been touched upon as being worried by what the UK government is doing, I would have thought you're going to end up with virtually all of civil society supporting the resistance to the UK government uh, and supporting constructive uh, going forward. You're nodding there, Jason, you're agreeing with yeah. what... You want me to write any of this that I'm in the middle of writing? I'm suffering from autocorrect, knowing better than I do what I want to say, but apart from that... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 one of my colleagues did explain to me that when you think about it, it's almost the kind of uh, the other way around from the withdrawal agreement, where I think the withdrawal agreement was let's let's pick the things that we want to kind of hang on to. Whereas this bill is just we're going to shove everything, <laughs> we're just going to shove everything off the cliff and then maybe think, what could we, what would we like to keep hold of in some shape or form? So, it's a very 
yeah, it's a very odd way to kind of extract yourself. Mm. And uh, in fact, what you said about the Internal Market Act is interesting as well, because although it's a Westminster Act, it, it covers all of the markets within the UK, so all of the sub um, sets. And really, what they're doing by doing away with um, protections of animal health and food safety and so on, um, that means for our farmers, it's going to continue to be more expensive if we don't do away with them to, to maintain the standards required by Scottish legislation. Therefore, we could be arguing that what the UK government has just done is, is unfair under the internal market bill because it's changed the marketplace without considering um, what's happening in other parts of the UK. But I guess they would just say, well, you just have to follow us because the, low, the lowest denominator is the common denominator, which is a bit of a tragic situation. But Bill, yeah. you have yeah. your... I, I noticed um, yesterday or the day before uh, the NFU in Scotland had put out their kind of, here's here's what we're planning on working on in 2023 kind of list. And, and high on their list is the retained EU law bill. It's a priority for them. Yeah. Um, and they talked about you know, big consequences uh, and outstanding issues regarding future trading arrangements. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, it is a huge, huge worry for them. And certainly in the, the kind of debates we've seen in Westminster so far, SNP and Labour have been both very strong on talking about the impact on Scottish food and farming. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And Bill, you have a question? Yeah, thanks. Um, the, the <laughs> Very useful canter through all this stuff, Jason. Uh, now, on Clive's point, uh, the it's, it's obviously encouraging that there's a kind of as a route forward for for Scottish government. But I wonder to what extent we're maybe being too optimistic about the scope for things like the Internal Market Bill. Now, you, you said you hadn't touched on that, but does that not in a sense, override a lot of the protection, a, a lot of you know, by introducing uh, a law which is making it mandatory to treat products from anywhere in the UK as as valid across the UK. Does that not effectively undermine uh, any uh, any protections which exist in Scotland? Um, and is, is that not how uh, UK government would undermine the devolution settlement rather than um, directly head on. Yeah, I mean, I think that echoes what the Tobias Lock chat was saying in that uh, conference I went to, where you know it's the Internal Markets Act. Does that get triggered? What what does that lead to? Does that prompt some kind of of legal challenge? Um, and again. I think the ball is is in the UK government's court to kind of say the, these are the potential scenarios that we're all kind of looking at now. Where's where's the reassurance you can give us that it's not going to end up in this kind of situation? And we've yet to have those kind of reassuring noises. So um, they're they're very good at saying, "Oh, don't worry, everything will be fine," but but then not explaining how it will be fine. That's why I think it's so important that organisations like ours on a smaller scale than the RSPB must be out there making the public more aware of the implications of, of legislation that the way Parliament is in terms of political balance at the moment just gets passed through with no reporting. A lot of it's done in committee, it's not even done on the floor of the House, and people are not aware of the implications of the Internal Market Act at all and I'm sure if you explain because I, I think having thought it through a bit more listening to Bill just now I mean actually it's probably was a very clever move because now that they've got the internal market bill my issue about the fact that direct directly implementable legislation from the EU can't be can't be overturned if it's been passed in the Scottish Parliament is irrelevant because even if that all stays as enacted legislation in the Scottish Parliament, if the EU and if the UK internal market is going to work on the basis of the lowest common denominator and all of that same legislation in Westminster is just wiped away, nobody's going to care that that legislation still exists in Scotland, except people who are in Scotland are going to have to comply with it. Um, but actually, 
as an if I was a consumer living in England in the future, if that's the case, the standards have been swept away in England, I would go and buy my food in Scotland. In fact, I would probably move to Scotland, as it seems to be happening all over the place. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that the internal market bill is is a terribly dangerous weapon. Sorry, the, the, the problem is that the food distribution network in the UK is across the UK. Yeah, exactly. But but stuff that you know, if you go to if I go to my Morrison's here in St Andrews, I get much more local stuff than you know if I if I was going to Morrison's in I don't know Yorkshire, I wouldn't get Scottish meat if, necessarily. If you, know, if you know what you're looking for. Yeah. Well, that's why we have to raise it into the public and make sure that people understand that um, if this if this new um, bill goes ahead, um, that's what can, needs to come out of the Lords, actually. They just need, because there, as you said, there are so many more real experts sitting in the Lords that re, the information about what it means really needs to get out. We need to get, get hold of some good journalists who will take it apart. Sorry, I don't mean to hog the floor. Who else would like to ask something? Paul Northway, thanks. Um, I would hate to uh, put in a note of alarm, but we have had two ex-Prime Ministers recently, and they both can nominate a whole slew of more Lords to pack the House of Lords, uh, in excess of 60 each, and that will dramatically reduce the competence of the House of Lords to mm. discuss this on an impartial basis. Uh, we just have to look at some of the, the Lords that were appointed in the wake of the Brexit vote without uh, naming too many names. They were pretty dire on the level of expertise, I would say, and a lot of them thankfully don't turn up to the House of Lords. But when they are required, they can be called upon to vote down anti-government um, uh, corrections to the bills and um, before I think the government saw this vote leave government saw the, the the power of the House of Lords in voting down some of the um, pro-government amendments and bringing through their own amendments to I hate to use the word water down, but maybe improve the legislation that was being put before it. But I don't see that being as easy in the future with another 120 plus um, government backing lords who have got a, a much lower expertise than some of the experts that are already there. The other thing I would say, and the question for me is, how can the RSPB, the National Trust, and the various other very large organizations work together to combat this because mm. together they have got many millions yeah. uh, of supporters in a non-political way. There are huge problems with sewage, for example, at the moment, right across uh, England, which I'm sure is a very good example of what happens when the legislation is not fit for purpose as it is in water quality, which must be affecting the RSPB's work in a lot of areas already. And I think it's a sign of things to come with this bonfire of EU regulations. The other question is um, a little bit along the lines of that, is that the Freeport's original legislation if that is resurrected in any way, we're not talking about small areas round a port. We're talking about very large areas. The port of, I think it was Southampton or Portsmouth, I can't remember. It was the entire county of Hampshire, entire Isle of Wight were all included in the one supposedly free port area. They're huge areas and they cover vast tracts of uh, immensely important uh, and vulnerable land to wildlife and, and particularly estuaries etc which are extremely important to obviously the RSPB. Yeah, yeah but thanks Paul. Uh, on the point of reminding people of our membership and sort of combined membership of the different environmental groups that does that does catch politicians Mm -hmm. attention um i was in a meeting a kind of coalition meeting of uh there's a coalition called stop climate chaos scotland um and we had a meeting recently and 
uh, somebody reminded us we have a joint membership, all the groups involved, or I think it's 1.7 million. And that's just that's in, that's just in Scotland. Mm -hmm. So these groups, we do have membership and we're all quite varied. But I would say that the thing that was surprising um, in September was it was, you know, RSPB, National Trust, normally quite mild mannered. But the feedback we were getting from the members was they they agreed with us that you know this was the time to be angry, um, and I guess the you know I'm, I'm in charge of campaigns and the thing I would say about campaigns is that you want to kind of choose your moments, can't constantly be marching the troops up the hill, um, and never get to the top of the hill. So we need to we need to choose choose our moments carefully. So yeah, this thing might get a bit stuck in the Lords, which would be a good thing. And I remember the SNP were proposing all sorts of amendments to kind of delay it and slow it down and change it. Labour, I think, were proposing, proposing amendments as well to do the same. So it seems there's an a all-out approach at Westminster to, to try squashing this thing um, and watering it down as best it can. Um, so quite where the point comes where we, we rally the troops again, um, it will almost take another kind of really serious moment for that to happen. But uh, what I do recall though was, so one of our uh, ambassadors, so RSPB has a series of kind of high profile people that speak on our behalf and Chris Packham, who presents a lot of the kind of Spring Watch programs and Autumn Watch and stuff. Mm -hmm. So he was on the verge of kind of mobilizing a big march in London, uh, but we didn't get around to doing that because of rail strikes and so on. But that looks as though it will still be happening and that will happen in the spring. So assuming this bill is still floating around at Westminster, then Chris Packham and his gang will be organising and mobilising and we'll be getting in behind that. So there will, I'm pretty sure there will be a big event at some point in the spring to bring this back to people's attention. Um, and you mentioned getting good journalists. So if, I'll just pop a note in the chat, but... Um, so Lisa O'Carroll at The Guardian, so she writes Brexit flavoured stuff yes. and she's very, very good. And she was very good, actually. She was live tweeting um, some of the uh, retained EU law bill debates mm -hmm. that had happened at Westminster. Um, mm -hmm. And I found some of her tweets just kind of, you know, people in Parliament kind of obviously seeing this thing for the first time and going, what on earth is this? So she's <laughs> definitely one to one to follow. Mm -hmm. Thanks. That's that's also very useful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Does anyone who hasn't spoken want to put another question? No. Yes. It's interesting what you say about finding. A, oh, sorry, Paul. Were you going to say something? Yes. Yeah, so really developing what the other Paul said earlier, and that is in terms of uh, sort of political activity. Uh, you mentioned in your introduction that a lot of the, your members were conservative with a small c. I imagine also you have a fair number, at least in England, who are conservative with a large c. Uh, and is there not some way they could be employed to apply pressure on their own MPs yeah. uh, and that way try and influence the legislation? Yeah. Yeah, so the we did a... So part of the campaign was... Uh, we'd, we'd set up basically a template letter, you know, you can write to your MP, here's our areas of concern, you can, you know, amend this letter, so it's in your own words if you want, and so over in the end, over 100,000 people did that, um, and I guess I'm in the lucky position that, you know, when we when we do these campaigns, we say to people, we'd be quite interested to see what responses you get, um, mm. so I have seen a whole stream of responses from different MPs uh, from different parties and uh, I guess the telling thing about uh, pretty much all the responses that came back from Conservative MPs was that they were just immediately kind of dismissing it and shutting it down oh what are you talking about this is nonsense of course of course we care about the environment we'd never do anything um, and this is just scaremongering and the RSPB are just trying to drum up membership and this is about fundraising and things like that uh, and we also had some very rude comments uh, directed at us on social media from uh, some conservative politicians as well, who just, they really didn't like the fact that we had drawn attention to this and had got the members um, so enraged. But I think that's the thing, that even if you are, you know, if, if you're a conservative government and you've managed to cheese off 
the membership of the National Trust and the RSPB, mm-hmm. then you've you've done something badly wrong. And I yeah. think yeah. I think we've, we've kind of recognised that by yeah. rowing back on the investment zones. And mm-hmm. I don't I don't know what they're going to do with this bill, but maybe they will just decide to kind of extend it and find a way to mm-hmm. slow it down and do it differently. Mm-hmm. I thought it was interesting as well that you mentioned, um, you know, momentum and the right moment in time. So it was something we had our AGM on Saturday and it was something we were talking about too, that there have been moments, you know, obviously before the final decision about Brexit, but then equally um, as we were sort of coming up to it actually happening. But we feel that the, the, the moment's kind of beginning to rise again now is that polling is really showing that it's not just in Scotland that people are really more open to uh, we've got to get back into Europe message now because I think we're sufficiently post-pandemic for people to realise that a lot of the problems that we're facing, which is beginning to make Britain feel like a bit of a third world country sometimes, is actually as a result of Brexit and nothing to do with Ukraine and nothing to do with the pandemic. Yeah, exactly. And I know we don't want to politicise because I think it's important that um, the, this huge membership that you and other nature organisations have is left apolitical, um, but will still fight against this particular piece of very political legislation. Mm-hmm. But it, I think that all the grassroots pro pro EU movements should be taking the the potential impact of this bill as a as another thing to focus on in in raising public awareness about what what the full implications of Brexit that has not yet been done are actually going to be. Yeah. Um, so. It would be good to know about dates and things for the Chris Packham thing, um, because it would be a good time to be if we're out on the street as well to say, look, all these people are going are marching for this reason. And mm-hmm. yeah, sorry, Bill, I, I, I just saw your hand up as I opened my mouth again. Sorry, unmute. Yeah, I was actually going to make a similar point, Joe. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the, I mean, we we have uh, a group that we're um, supporting called uh, National Remain, uh, Na- March to Remain, I think it's called, mm. um, which is UK wide. National Rejoin March. National Rejoin March. It changes yeah. its name, Joe. From- <laughs> <laughs> um, and- but it's just important that it's Rejoin and not Remain anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a bit that stays the same. Yeah. Uh, they. They've, they're planning events across the UK on, I think it's the 25th of March, is it, Joe? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah 25th, so two days after the, the 23rd. Um, so, you know, if, if it, it might be sensible to kind of, obviously, informally, because you couldn't have a formal coordination going on, but it might be sensible to um, keep an eye on that one. Um the um, I, I wanted to ask a couple of specific questions. One of them, I mean, I should know the answer to this, I'm sure, but I don't. Uh, I, I don't think there's any investment zones uh, established or kind of in any way agreed yet in Scotland. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Scottish, I think Scottish government had officials were basically seeking information from the UK government about what are these things and um, apart they obviously you know haven't, haven't needed to continue that conversation because they've changed so okay so so we, 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 we have uh, we have a bit of time there it's just uh, there's, I mean that's obviously if that were to go ahead that would introduce a significant local complication. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about was there's been some criticism of Scottish government recently about not keeping pace on uh, Russell's legislation as it emerges. Um, the figure I saw was 600 pieces of legislation, and amongst the list of categories in that legislation was environment. Uh, I, I, I would it would be interesting to get your perspective on that. The criticism being, of course, that Scottish government had said that it would it would uh, keep aligned with the EU in order to ease its, it, the pass for for Scotland to rejoin, um, and that's this is obviously an independence-minded Scottish government, 
uh, path to rejoin as an independent country. Do you have a, a, a is, is, is that an accurate or a reasonable criticism from your perspective? It, it's it's news to me. Um, so do you, do you remember who the criticism was coming from? And was there a specific kind of area of environment mentioned or? Uh, no, it, it's, it's a newspaper report. It's uh, it's in the Herald. Mm. Uh, and the source was Michael Keating. Okay. Professor Michael Keating, backed up by our old friends. Not that Michael Keating isn't an old friend. Uh, but uh, Kirsty Hughes and Anthony Salamone. Uh, so they, they've been, and their, their argument is that the Scottish government needs to put more resources in to monitor this. They accept that it's not easy when you don't have right, any exactly. in the chamber. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But the, the, you know, the, there is nonetheless, there is a need if, if that is genuinely what what the uh, Scottish government, how Scottish government is setting its stall out for the future. In my view, it's exactly the sort of thing Scotland Scotland House officials ought to be doing, Bill. Yeah, I, I think the article... Oh, they're still in Brussels. <laughs> I think that the, 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 the article acknowledged that, but it seemed to suggest that it was, you know, there was, there was the, the, they weren't keeping pay, they weren't keeping up with the, the volume of change. Yeah. Um, I, I just, just quickly on the on the future generations legislation in Wales. That's been around for quite a long time now. Um, yeah. Several yeah. years. Um, mm -hmm. And it was used, I believe, to stop a bypass uh, maybe three, four, five years ago. Oh, yeah. I think they've expanded it now, though, Bill. Oh, yeah. Think, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I think they've expanded the application of it, Meryl. Yeah. I think that, you know, yeah. they, but, but I mean, to me, it seemed like a, a brilliant piece of legislation. Mm, and it, it, you know, it, it is exactly the sort of, essentially what it boils down to is every investment decision must take account of the, the effects, the, the kind of the, the value to future generations, as, a, as opposed to the, the, yeah. the value in the developer's pocket for, yeah. Um, yeah. for, for, yeah. for the current generation, which is mm -hmm. quite a different, uh, different perspective. Um, yeah. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm rabbiting on now. Um, I mean, it, it would be good if, if uh, I mean, it would, it would be lovely to see RSPB mobilise its considerable lobby power, mm. not just throw its toys out the pram once, but to sort of uh, keep sustained pressure there. Uh, I mean, it's, it's almost pointless in Scotland because, you know, the, the, the case is... The case is pretty convincing. Everybody's accepted it. The, the, the pressure needs to come where uh, where the Conservative MPs have their seats, which by and large is not Scotland. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, um, yeah. Beryl, you had a question as well. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's still a lot. I mean, RSPB still does, you know, an awful lot of campaigning on various things in Scotland very effectively. And often together with other, you know, some of the other link organisations, but we we all rely on we all rely on our SPB so much. They're very generous with their staff staff time, and let them participate in these things. Um, yeah, this keeping pace is a bit of concern. A concern I hadn't heard that Bill, but um, you can you can keep abreast of what's happening in the European. Uh, you know, in, in the European Parliament, and there's the European Environment Bureau that you, you can, you know, even as an individual, I, I've signed up for uh, various publications. They're, they're all online that come out and research papers and discussions. And I th you remember when we had Lloyd that, who came to speak to us all yeah. a long time ago now, uh, he pointed that one out. It's very useful to sign up for that. Um, Free ports, though, Jason, there, there have been a couple discussed in Scotland, haven't there? Wasn't there one up in the northeast and one even up in the northwest? Or was it just the local authority in the northwest that was keen? Yeah, so I think Aberdeen is gunning for, yeah. I, think, I think in Scotland they're called green free ports, but I yes. think it's worth, mm -hmm. worth noting that yeah. they are excluded from the Butte House Agreement between Scottish Government and Scottish Greens. So I don't think Greens think 
green um, green ones are particularly green. Yes. Uh, and I think uh, I've not I've not had much to do with the free ports issue, but mm. a couple of a couple of um, maybe press stories in the last few months, and just asking for our general view. And I think our general view tends to be, well, we'd have to see mm. a location, and if anything is going to impact on a, a habitat or a protected species, then you know we don't have serious concerns. Mm. I'm conscious that it's almost eight o'clock and um, oh, oh, past eight o'clock now. And um, so, Jason, you've spent given us a lot of time. Thank you very much. Um, and perhaps it would be possible for I don't know whether you produce a sort of regular update on on what's happening with this, um, that we could somehow be on a mailing list to to get updates and perhaps know some useful because we, we are starting to go back out on the street again. And it's always really helpful if we can have some. Um, sort of more expert information about when people say to us, oh, what is this bill to know exactly where things have got to and what other, others are doing in terms of action. That, that is a good point. So, uh, so yeah, I'm fairly new to the, the campaigns role at RSPB, but one of the kind of things I've, I've been keen to get them to do is is to continue conversations with people about campaigns because you know I think we're all used now to signing petitions and clicking on buttons to take action and make things happen and you kind of wonder whatever happened to that um so we've now a couple of times we've gone back to our supporters to say this thing that you did a few months ago here's what impact it had here's the latest position on that um and that gets a really big response from people so so mm -hmm. I yeah I'm totally on board with the Let's try and keep you know, groups like yours updated on what we're thinking and where this has got to. Um, we have a monthly newsletter and we have a website that's visited quite frequently. So if you have things like petitions or, or questionnaires that you want people to respond to you on this sort of issue, I'm sure quite a lot of our members would be very interested in getting involved. So we could perhaps um, be another place for you to put that sort of information. Um, I'll also I'll pop in the chat. So Scottish government got in touch recently because they've put together um, a bit of their website, which explains um, what's what this bill is all about, and they they've kind of gathered together um, comments from ourselves, but other organisations. Mm -hmm. So it covers food rights at work, nature and the environment, and business and trade. So it's a really handy. I've sent this to a few people before. This is a really handy kind of they're keeping this updated on what their current position is on this. So I'll, I'll share that with you. And that's quite a good one yeah. to, to share. Thanks for the website, Bill. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oops, I just lost you all because I opened it, sorry. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, if, if you can, remember us whenever you're putting together future things on this on this campaign we'd be really grateful for that thank you jason and thank you very much for your time tonight i'm sure everyone very much enjoyed hearing more about that so thanks a lot thanks for inviting me along that was great good questions <laughs> friendly crowd <laughs> thank you yeah well I, I hope that some of our other local groups may benefit from being able to watch um mm. uh, and hear what you said um, so you'll, you'll find it um, probably in a few in a couple of weeks. The recording will be available on our website if that's okay with you. Okay, cool. Thanks very much. I'll just stop the recording now. Okay, but if you.